pay because obviously uh, Tunisia uh, is under an IMF program, but we see uh, sort of a widespread incidence today of renewed debt crises coming along. And many of the protests that we're seeing from Ecuador to Lebanon are at least in part inspired uh, by austerity measures or tax hikes or subsidy removals in response to uh, concerns over rising public debt levels. Uh, today, 40% of Sub-Saharan Africa uh, is considered by the IMF to be in debt distress or at high risk of debt distress. Uh, so that really shows that this issue of debt remains a very pertinent question and will, in my opinion, in the next years become even more so as we head into sort of a, what appears to be uh, a new uh, emerging debt crisis. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about my book and the sort of perspective that it provides on the European question and then perhaps we can afterwards in the Q&A look a bit more forward and, and address some of these more present concerns. Uh, so for me, a really important moment in understanding international debt uh, is its emergence in the sort of north-south relation in the 1820s, because that's really the first moment that you start seeing large-scale international lending from, let's call it the core countries, especially the city of London, um, towards the periphery, specifically Latin America, but also to uh, a certain extent some of the Mediterranean countries, both Southern Europe, uh, the Middle East, and, and North Africa. So the, the 1820s are really an important moment because there is a coincidence of two factors. First, a number of countries gain independence. Uh, in Latin America, there's a number of countries that are struggling for independence against the Spanish, um, but also a country like Greece gained independence from the Ottoman Empire in the 1820s. And that sort of coincided with a speculative boom on the London Stock Exchange. And that speculative boom uh, led a lot of London investors to pool their money in buying the bonds of these newly independent countries. And what you start seeing as a result is that within the space of a couple of years, a lot of these Latin American countries in particular accumulate more debts than they are able to repay. And this leads to great concerns because while these countries gained political independence during this period, there was a growing awareness that their financial dependence on international investors uh, rendered them dependent in a different way and hadn't allowed them to fully achieve the kind of sovereignty that they had in mind. Uh, and this comes out very clearly, for instance, in the writings of uh, Simon Bolivar, the famous independence uh, fighter of, uh, of, of, of South America, when he wrote to his uh, finance minister in Peru and said, look, we need to liquidate all the mines to basically have the resources to repay our lenders in, uh, in London. And he ended his letter by sort of uh, stating all the achievements of the, um, of the independence uh, fighters and then concluding with the statement, God save us from the debt and we shall be content. And that kind of highlights the extent to which debt remained in a way the unsevered umbilical cord that kept tying Latin America to Europe, even after formal political independence. Nevertheless, I think the 1820s are equally interesting for a way in which um, they indicate that these countries nevertheless had a significant degree of autonomy compared to many developing countries today because of the way they responded to that crisis. So while they initially tried to repay in the 1820s, by 1826, starting with Peru, one after the other, when they ran out of foreign exchange, they simply stopped paying those external obligations. They simply declared a unilateral moratorium on their debt servicing, and they maintained those moratoria for sometimes up to 20 or 30 years. And that was quite a remarkable feat, especially in sort of you know, the current context, if we look at what happens today. Um, because the bondholders had very little power to actually reclaim these investments and to force these countries to pay up. So they maintained their moratorium sometimes for 20 or 30 years and did not renegotiate the debts until their economies had recovered and they were able um, to basically renegotiate them on fairly favorable terms. So even though there was this sort of umbilical cord keeping Latin America tied to Europe, there was a significant degree of economic autonomy that allowed these countries to respond in a way that allowed them to inflict some of the sort of adjustment costs of the crisis onto the lenders. So the bondholders took a big hit in the 1820s. Nevertheless, what happened is that in the 1860s, a renewed wave of speculative investment took hold on the London Stock Exchange, and we saw a second big wave of international lending. Again, mostly centered on Latin America and some of the Mediterranean countries. Uh, this time also the Ottoman Empire and its many provinces, including Tunisia 
Egypt, uh, and a number of other countries. And again, this sort of second wave of international lending led to a mass wave of unilateral defaults. So in the 1870s, starting with the depression of 1873, you see a massive wave of unilateral suspensions uh, of payments across Latin America and the Mediterranean region. And this time, though, there was a different response on the part of the lenders. Um, of course, this is known as sort of the era of imperialism um, that really took hold in that period. And so we start seeing a number of ex prominent examples of creditor countries aggressively intervening in the debtor countries in order to ensure continued debt repayment. And there's a number of prominent examples of that. Uh, for instance, the imposition of international financial control on the Ottoman Empire, um, the invasion of Egypt after the international financial control there failed to produce the desired results. The British simply invaded and incorporated Egypt as a protectorate. Uh, Tunisia has had a very similar experience in the wake of its own sort of failed international financial control program um, after being sort of incorporated uh, into the French Empire as a protectorate. Uh, but Latin America saw similar developments, though slightly different, across different regions. So in South America, there were no massive interventions to speak of. But in the Caribbean area, including in Venezuela, there were a number of European creditor interventions to try to get these countries to repay. Uh, Venezuela is a very prominent example where the Europeans sent in gunboats in order to force the government to repay. In response to that, the US government declared the uh, Roosevelt corollary to the Monroe Doctrine uh, because it was afraid that the Europeans would keep coming in to keep demanding uh, the repayment of European bondholders. And so basically what the Americans did is they started acting as a police power in what they considered their own backyard to take over that function as an enforcer of bondholder contracts in the region. So you start seeing from the sort of late 19th century onwards uh, a growing interference by the United States in the Caribbean and Central American countries, including in a number of cases outright occupation of custom houses um, by US Marines. Uh, so there's a very sort of prominent turn in the late 19th and early 20th centuries towards imperialist finance and direct control over the debtors in order to force them to repay. Um, nevertheless, uh, this was a fairly limited phenomenon historically because by the 1920s, after the First World War, a new speculative wave of investment takes off and we see another sort of debt crisis emerging in the 1930s. But this time, the type of large-scale military interventions that had taken place in the late 19th and early 20th centuries were no longer considered legitimate. So what we see once again in the 1930s is a mass wave of sovereign defaults. And basically, most of Latin America and a large part of Europe suspended payments in this crisis and did not resume payments again for many, uh, uh, many, many years. And this allowed them, in a way, to gain some much needed fiscal breathing space that allowed their economies to recover uh, and that, in a sense, made the Latin American debt crisis of the 30s less severe than subsequent debt crises, especially of the 1980s would be. Um, and the reason that I'm mentioning this history is because I think it's, it's very interesting in a way, uh, because it poses a very strong contrast to what we see today. Even though we have, in some parts of this history, active military intervention by the creditor powers and attempts to establish direct financial control, uh, actually, in each major crisis period, the 1820s, the 1870s, and the 1930s, there was a mass wave of sovereign defaults which indicates that there was at least some autonomy on the part of the debtors uh, to pursue their own response to the crisis. Uh, this changed really dramatically after the Second World War. And that's why I think it's interesting to try to understand that, that deeper history. Um, obviously, after the Second World War, we had the Bretton Woods regime. That imposed very strict controls on international capital flows that prevented investors from lending uh, towards you know, lending abroad, essentially, in, in, in large volumes. So there were no major international debt crises to speak of until the Bretton Woods regime started to break down in the 1970s. And that's when we start seeing this sort of fourth wave of massive international lending to the global south that leads up, finally, in 1982, to the Mexican debt crisis that eventually spirals out to become the developing country debt crisis of that decade. And the response there is, is, is really different in the sense that even though many of these countries are incapable of repaying their debts and they declare um, that they have to you know, undertake some kind of measures in order to 
uh, stabilize the situation, there is no attempt, unlike the 1930s or before, to unilaterally suspend payments. Instead, the debtors undertake these negotiated restructure or reschedulings, actually, with their foreign creditors. And the whole approach to crisis management changes in a dramatic way, because not only is there this sort of shift in um, approach that there is an attempt to reschedule the debts multilaterally, but there's also an attempt uh, on the part of the creditors to intervene very aggressively in a really new way, namely by disbursing these large international bailout loans um, under the aegis of the International Monetary Fund uh, to try to keep these countries solvent, but at the same time to demand these really extreme policy conditions that are geared towards freeing up domestic resources for foreign debt servicing. And that kind of switch, which we now take for granted, it really only came about in 1982, and it was a relatively novel phenomenon. And what we've seen since then is that there's been a very stark decline in the incidence of sovereign default. So unfortunately, I didn't bring uh, any graphs, but there's actually a very spectacular uh, graph, um, five minutes, cool, uh, a very spectacular graph that shows the spectacular decline in the incidence of sovereign default since 1982. Um, and basically what we have today is even in the wake of the global financial crisis of 2008, uh, we have only, uh, we have less than 1% of total world sovereign debt in a state of default, which is actually a historic low. So what we find is a real contradiction at the heart of the international debt regime today, which is that on the one hand, public debt levels today are higher than they've ever been before. I mean, if you weight them, um, it might actually not be the case that uh, some of the post-World War II debts were higher in the developed world. But if you take it sort of on, a, on an absolute level, public debt levels today are higher than ever before. Uh, also, international financial crises are increasingly frequent since the 1970s. So you would expect sort of a replay of this type of mass unilateral payment suspensions that we saw throughout history. But we see the very opposite. We see that that's becoming rarer and rarer and rarer. So we have to sort of investigate what are the... 15 minutes left, okay, yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> I was like, wow. So, what you see is this spectacular decline in the incidence of, of, of sovereign default, and we have to understand what are some of the deep structural changes that underlie that transformation. And so the book is essentially about that, like trying to answer the question, what are those structural transformations in the capitalist world economy since the 1980s that allow creditors to recover so much of their investments even in the absence of direct military intervention? So why is it that today the enforcement of international debt contracts is more, in a way, is more effective than ever. And I would propose that that has something to do with a change in the international financial architecture. And so the way that I look at it is that there's been, well, there's been many structural changes over the past decades, but there's three that are particularly relevant um, to the question of sovereign debt repayment. And the first has to do with essentially the huge concentration and centralization in the international credit system that has gone hand in hand with this process of financialization, right? One thing that we see is that there's been a very stark decline in the amount of large financial institutions involved in sovereign lending, and um, that essentially sovereign debt or bonds are, are increasingly held by an ever smaller circle of systemically important players. So whereas in the 1930s you find that most of the U.S., uh, or actually most of the Latin American debt was held by hundreds of thousands of dispersed U.S. bondholders, many of them small, you know, savers and investors, um, you can understand that, that it's difficult for these people uh, to try to organize collective action in order to force these debtors to repay their debts. They simply had no leverage, they had no sort of structural power to try to enforce repayment. This changed really dramatically from the 1970s onwards because ever since there's been a huge concentration in the lending structure. So in the 80s it was because the type of lending was different, it was syndicated bank lending. So the type of creditors involved were mostly US money center banks, Wall Street banks and to a lesser extent some European and Japanese banks that held the debt. And for these banks, because they were smaller in number and they were systemically important and they were sort of, you know, uh, their interests were structurally interlocked, it was much easier to coordinate collective action, to work together, to ensure that on the one hand, they would continue keeping, um, they would continue to lend to some of the countries that were willing to repay but unable to. So that allowed some of the refinancing that happened in the 1980s. 
But at the same time, it also allowed them, when there was a risk of default, when a country actually didn't want to fully repay, to collectively withhold all further credit, as happened, for instance, in the case of Peru, when it temporarily limited some of its debt payments uh, in, uh, in the late 80s. So basically, this lending structure allowed the creditors to much more successfully impose their will on the debtors, because they were smaller in number. And basically, the literature on the 1980s debt crisis therefore refers to the creditors as a creditor's cartel. And so the rise of the creditor's cartel for me is a very important explanatory category to try to explain why there's been this increased insistence on full repayment. And we see that even with the return to bond finance in the 1990s, the concentration at the heart of that lending structure remains intact. So take, for instance, the Greek crisis. Uh, the Greek crisis um, was basically a crisis of bond finance, um, like the crisis of the 1930s. But unlike the crisis of the 1930s, the concentration of Greek bond holdings was much, much higher. Basically, most creditors could be reduced, or most of the debt was held by a group of 10 to 20 systemically important European banks. And that meant, again, that these banks were able to organize collective action much more successfully than the dispersed bondholders of the 1930s had. So that's really one part of the story, that huge concentration and centralization of the lending structure. Um, but nevertheless, even a highly concentrated creditors cartel will tend to find it very important, a uh, very difficult, sorry, in a moment of crisis to force a country to repay when it's really on the verge of default. And again, we can look at the Greek case for that. And even this concentrated European creditors cartel, private creditors cartel, was unable after 2010 to ensure that Greece would stay solvent uh, because they had a tendency to pull out and stop lending to the Greek government, which caused its borrowing costs to rise, which made it more and more difficult to service the old, to refinance the old debts by borrowing uh, uh, anew. So at that moment, what arises is kind of a systemic need for an official creditor to step in and provide the function of an international lender of last resort. And nowadays, we're very used to the International Monetary Fund coming in and fulfilling that role. But actually, that's a very novel development that didn't really exist prior to 1982, or at least prior to the 1970s. Um, first of all, because the IMF was created uh, only in 19, well, technically in 1944, or after the Second World War. Uh, but it was only really transformed into an international lender of last resort following the breakdown of the Bretton Woods regime in the 1970s. And particularly sort of under US influence in the 1980s, it saw a sort of a restructuring of its role um, towards that of an international policeman, as it were, of the Global South, an international financial policeman, to ensure that in the case of a major crisis, the IMF will come in, disburse those emergency loans, make them conditional on these far-reaching austerity measures, privatizations, liberalization programs, et cetera, et cetera, in order to free up resources for continued debt servicing. And so that function, it had been sort of partially fulfilled by private creditors before. So the Rothschild Bank, for instance, throughout the 19th century, um, engaged in a form of conditional lending. Um, it basically promised its own borrowers that it would continue to extend loans if they were in financial trouble, as long as they pursued certain reforms that made it more likely that the debt would be repaid. Uh, so there was an attempt to sort of fulfill that function at a private level. But it turns out that markets are not very good at um, coordinating that type of action, right? So there's kind of, from the creditor's perspective, a systemic need to have the IMF in there. And that's really also the lesson that you see of the 1980s, is that the bankers of the 1980s were absolutely rejoicing uh, at the return of the IMF because they realized that this was an absolutely crucial ingredient uh, to keep the debtors from defaulting. And next to that, to enforce some discipline on their uh, budgetary priorities and basically compel them to pursue the type of measures that would make it more likely that they would repay in full. So that's really the sort of second important enforcement mechanism that I look at. So the role of the IMF and its conditional lending. And it's not just the IMF because we could look beyond that. In the European context, of course, there was also the European Central Bank, the European Commission, the European creditor states that played a very important role. And behind the IMF, historically, there's always been the US government uh, that played a very active role as well. But nevertheless, I think that just looking at these two mechanisms would provide a partial picture, because they're essentially international mechanisms. And they would give the impression that you know, discipline is essentially today is imposed from abroad. 
uh, but it's not that simple because there are also ways in which discipline, debtor discipline is internalized into the debtor state apparatus through a number of sort of complex ways. And one thing that I look at in particular is the growing dependence, not just of states, but also of households uh, on private credit as a result of financialization. And the situation that that has led to is a situation in which it becomes increasingly costly to experience a cutoff of credit circulation in your economy. Because if there is a cutoff of credit circulation, it doesn't just affect the state in the sense that the state suddenly doesn't have the money to spend anymore and has to pursue austerity measures, but it also affects everyone else in the economy. Because if, if international creditors stop lending and stop investing in your economy as a developing country, it's very likely that your own banks will experience the spillover costs, the ramifications of that, and will stop lending in turn to domestic consumers, domestic businesses, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a great likelihood that a sovereign debt default will lead to a domestic financial crisis involving perhaps you know, a collapse of the banking system, potentially collapse of the pension system, which tends to be very highly exposed to its own government debt, and all kinds of other ramifications that make it very costly in the short term for a government to suspend payments. Um, and, and so this is a really important extra dimension that plays out much more at the domestic level. Because of course there are domestic players in a, de in a debtor country that tend to be more affected by, that kind of, uh, by those kind of spillover costs than others. So while working people, for instance, may be more affected by the austerity measures and by the cuts in wages and pensions, we can expect that certain businessmen and certain bankers are more likely to be affected by a cutoff of credit circulation. And they're more likely to be affected by, you know, if they hold government bonds, by a government default. So these groups will tend to, in times of crisis, exert pressure on their own governments to avoid a suspension of payments. And we can look at the Lebanese example, I think, as a, as a quite a powerful example of that. Because Lebanon today is one of the most heavily indebted countries in the world. And part of the reason for the protests that we're seeing today is that the government is desperately trying to create new sources of revenue in order to repay its enormous debts. Now this, um, of course, led to that WhatsApp tax, the infamous WhatsApp tax that, that sparked the current protests, which just goes to show sort of how desperate the government is to invent new sources of revenue. Um, but there's a, a sort of a crucial factor there that makes it very difficult for the Lebanese government to simply respond by saying, you know what, there's large protests, perhaps you know, to appease the people, we need, to inf we need to deflect some of the costs of adjustment by suspending payments on the debt, uh, and that way we screw over the foreign creditors, but we can you know, help our own citizens, uh, get some breathing room. Unfortunately, that's not the case, because a lot, of, a lot of the debt is actually held by Lebanese banks. A lot of the debt is held domestically. So that would mean that if the Lebanese government were to default on its debt, it would likely lead to a collapse of the domestic banking system. And that would have all kinds of ramifications uh, for the domestic economy and for ordinary Lebanese people uh, that make it very costly in the short term to pursue that kind of approach that was so common prior to World War II. And you see a very similar dynamic in the Greek case. In the Greek case as well, Greek pension funds and Greek banks held a significant share of the, their own government's debt. And it was not the largest share. I mean, 80% of the Greek debt at the start of the crisis was held abroad, mostly by German and French banks. But that sort of domestically held debt was just enough, especially because as a proportion of the sort of the bank's uh, own uh, capital, it was such a large share. Uh, it was just enough to sort of make the costs of a default so high domestically that it served to internalize discipline within the state apparatus. So there's that sort of third dimension that plays out at the domestic level that I think is very important to keep in mind. And now if you take all of them together, it, it leads to a, what, what looks like, yeah, a fairly depressing image, right? An image that would give us the impression that this is next to impossible to break out of. And so maybe in my last sort of concluding sentences, I want to give the impression that I'm actually not that pessimistic. Uh, but that I completely agree with um, what we heard in earlier presentations, especially the first one, where um, there was this really strong emphasis on the need for radical change. Radical change in a sense of structural change going back to the roots of the problem. And so if we're going to talk about the problem of sovereign debt bondage today and of forms of neocolonialism that persist through the debtor-creditor relation, 
we have to talk, in my opinion, about those three enforcement mechanisms and the way that they underpin the enormous increase in the power of international finance over the past decades. And so we have to think of ways to, to really sort of dismantle that enormous concentration and centralization of the credit system. And we have to think of other ways to provide credit that don't just depend on the creditor's cartel and its own profit incentive and its own market power. So that is one fundamental ingredient of what a structural solution would have to look at. Different ways of providing credit that go beyond the current creditor's cartel. The second one would have to target the sort of institutionalization, if you will, of international financial intervention. And the real transformation of the IMF's role into an international financial policeman and an enforcer of creditors' contracts. If you don't contest that in one way or another, and I'm not proposing a particular solution here, but if you don't tackle that problem, you're likely going to have official creditors continuing to come in in these crises to defend the interests of private creditors by ensuring continued repayment. Right? So one way to do that might be to think of a way that you turn the IMF perhaps into an organization that is much more concerned with debt restructuring than it is with enforcing continued repayment and, and continuous bailouts. Right? And the third one that you would have to think of is, is really how to reduce that dependence, that financial dependence that has come along with this process of financialization and that leads states, corporations, and households to be ever more dependent on private credit for their own sort of continued existence. And so if you have sort of an integrated approach that tackles all three of these, I believe that's when you can start seeing a real change in terms of how you deal with the outcomes of these international debt crises. But unfortunately, it's probably no longer possible to go back to the type of solutions that were common prior to World War II and simply insist that countries should always stop repaying. And even though I, I would prefer that to be the case, um, and you know, I, I, I completely share the spirit of um, the Burkina Bay revolutionary uh, Sankara, Thomas Sankara, uh, who argued that we need sort of a common front of the debtors and the creditors to collectively resist that imposition of neo-colonial finance in the new period, right? Uh, he argued that very forcefully in the 1980s debt crisis and he paid for it with his life. Um, but, I, but I also think that beyond sort of, you know, that insistence on the need of a debtor's cartel to oppose the creditor's cartel, we really need to think about structural change in the international financial architecture to try to roll back the power of finance and reclaim some of that autonomy and economic sovereignty on the part of the debtor countries of this world. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Jerome, for this interesting talk. Um, I would propose that we are opening the floor for um, questions because uh, Jerome also has to leave early. So um, I would collect some questions. Maybe someone can take a... Nank, we have one, yeah. Okay, yes. Okay, Joran, that was a really fascinating talk, and I've just bought your book. <laughs> so I'm sure this is, a, no, seriously, that's a really good part of um, overall analysis. I think it's really exciting. So my question then was, how does China come into it, particularly in the African context? When you talk about diversifying from the cartel, mm -hmm. Is it adding to the cartel, or is it another cartel, or is it adding to the diversity, particularly in the African context? So, apart from, and apart from China, what would that look like? Because, I mean, perhaps my preoccupation is when you're saying of the need for development and infrastructure in Africa, where are they going to get the funds? Thanks very much. Yeah, we had one question, yeah. Hi there, uh, thank you for your talk. I wondered whether you could, like, since there are so many Germans about, uh, including myself, uh, go on about the mechanisms included in the debt repayment um, agreements after the Second World War for Germany, which included like that debt payments could only be, you know, demanded once Germany runs a surplus. I just wanted to thank you very much for the speech. I could understand even without being specialized in monetary things, and it was very uh, explanative. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
Uh, is it me? Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, that was a great talk, and I was, I, you know, agree fully with it. But the one thing I just wanted to address, and, and um, um, maybe you might call it the elephant in the room, although I think that's been used a lot as a term. But it's just what I feel is that the whole narrative needs to be nonetheless underpinned by what I would call a structural analysis. What you call structural, I think, is more an institutional layer of sort of uh, creditor system, systems of, of managing credit in the, in the international system and so on. But how really to differentiate these crises and the ability to default has to be really underpinned by an understanding of the changing sort of production and consumption structures uh, in the world economy, and particularly industrialization, and how the industrialization gen um, both generates the external constraint, right? Uh, like to give the similar example, in the 1820s in Latin America, they could quite simply default and basically accept the external constraint with, uh, however, with, with, uh, without having any really effect on this production structure in the economy, right? Same as the 1870s, because that was just the beginning of sort of second waves of industrialization where Latin America would have just been starting to enter into it and themselves trying to practice ISI. 30s, you had the depression and the war, into, and then followed by the war, which cut them off, actually was a stimulus to ISI. But it was the post-war period where then these external constraints in the context of industrialization become so crucial, right? And it makes it so much more structurally difficult for them to default on top of the institutional factors that you're talking about, right? So I'm just wondering if we, if we lack that underlying structural discussion, um, uh, it's, I think it's, we're missing some of the really powerful economic factors, which I would also, I would bring that in also to a lot of the discussion yesterday. I didn't say much about it, but like the whole discussion about the Euro and Greece, for instance, the, the issue of Greece is that today, as opposed to the 1970s, uh, its production structure is heavily owned by Germany and other countries. So even if it leaves the Euro, its production structure remains dominated by non-Greek companies, which then <laughs> control, you know, control the production and the consumption of the economy. So you don't, you know, and Please it's that structural you, underpinning. Keep the okay, sorry, yeah. Short. But, yeah. <laughs> sorry, I just wanted to because it also and all, but also uh, the, the the fact that a lot of these crises, because it wasn't just in the 80s that you had the first crisis like that. Because what really informed a lot of dependency analysis was the crisis Brazil already entering into balance and payments crises in the 50s. I'm uh, sorry. Which, Do you have a question? Okay, sorry. Please, because um, I just want to throw that yeah, out. Yeah, because as a, otherwise as a, everybody is talking. It's more of a discussion. I'm just engaging with it. I just want to. We throw will that still out have too. time for yeah, discussions sure, sure. afterwards. Sorry. So I just want you to comment on that, anyways. <laughs> yeah. So okay. So one sec. We will just uh, let Jerome answer, and then um, and then I'll uh, take your questions. Great. Yeah. So thank you all for the questions. Um, I think the China question is a very interesting one. Uh, unfortunately, not one that I know as much about as I know about sort of the private credit dimension, right? Um, I do think that there is a, a, a risk in um, replacing one monopoly with another, right? So I think that the, sort of the experience so far has shown that uh, the Chinese are not immune to the same kind of speculative investments that we've seen in the past and they have their own mechanisms of enforcing repayment, even if the loan itself is not repaid, uh, there's usually a demand for some kind of um, um, collateral uh, to uh, return to the, uh, to the, to the lenders, uh, as in the case of the Sri Lankan port, for instance, that, um, that is now under Chinese control as a result of the inability to pay a loan, or uh, Venezuelan oil revenues, right? So I think that there's always sort of a risk in general in any debtor-creditor relation that if you have a single very powerful creditor or if you have a group, a small group of very large and powerful creditors like the private creditors cartel that I mentioned, and you have against that a set of sort of individually um, isolated, atomized debtors that depend on these creditors for external financing, you're going to find a kind of structural power relation between them that is usually to the disadvantage of the debtor. So I'm not under any illusions that the dependence on Chinese credit solves the problem um, of the dependence on Western credit. Um, nevertheless, I do think that there is a tendency now uh, towards increasing diversification uh, within the Sub-Saharan and Latin American context that may not be entirely to the advantage of the Western creditors. And there is a concern, I think, also among the international financial institutions that some of their structural power may be undermined as a result of the Russians and the Chinese coming in and being able to cut their own deals directly with the Venezuelan government, for instance. Um, so while I don't see it necessarily as a progressive development for many developing countries, um, 
although it might be in certain contexts, um, I do think that it's something that uh, at, a, at a deeper level contests the geopolitical power of Western finance. Uh, and that, I think, speaks to a broader shift in international power dynamics. Um, then there's a question about Germany. And um, again, I'm not an, sort of an expert on this. I don't know enough about it. Uh, but what I do know is that um, it's, it's potentially very interesting to think of debt restructuring as being uh, sort of conditioned by growth rates and by the ability to actually create a surplus. Um, because this would perhaps make debt servicing more sustainable and more bearable uh, for a debtor country. Uh, nevertheless, I think that also there we need to be careful uh, because I do know of an, a similar example uh, in the Argentine case which actually led to um, uh, sort of contrary outcomes uh, where the Argentine government in its 2005 debt restructuring included a, sort of a GDP warrant in its uh, restructured bonds that basically promised the institutional investors that were uh, accepting these renegotiated bonds uh, higher rates of return if Argentine GDP grew above a certain level. And since this was sort of the height of the international commodity boom, and since Argentina had a lot of catch-up growth uh, to do in the wake of its economic collapse of 2001-2002, it was very likely that it would actually exceed these growth levels. So what ended up happening is that the government wasn't fully aware or wasn't fully cognizant of the risks of what it was signing up to, but the investors were. And so it ended up paying much more over the course of the 2000s than it otherwise would have if it hadn't included the GDP warrant in those restructured bonds. Um, it was supposed to be a sweetener uh, for the private investors to actually sign up to that deal, but it ended up being uh, you know, a, a huge source of, of profits for them. Um, nevertheless, I do think that if you start talking about sort of the importance of institutionalized debt restructuring, you can talk about capping debt payments at a certain rate or a certain level. And another country that tried to do that, uh, unfortunately unsuccessfully, was Peru uh, in 1986. And it was punished very heavily for that uh, because it basically said, look, we have only a limited amount of foreign exchange and uh, we earn that foreign exchange through exports. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna set a, and we lose it through debt repayment. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna set a limit to the amount of debt repayment on the basis of how much we export every year. And that was actually a very sort of commonsensical approach, but it was um, shot down by Wall Street, who sort of aggressively cut off all further financing, as did the IMF, and really cut Peru off from any source of external financing, sending the economy into a tail dive. Um, the, gov the government at the time resorted to sort of inflationary measures to try to keep, uh, to keep things sort of um, alive, and that paved the way, in a way, for the Fujimori dictatorship. Uh, so there, there are sort of risks involved in, in, in this type of approach as well. Uh, and then the, to the third point of understanding the structural relationship with production and um, industry, I think that's a crucial point. And it's not something that I got to in the talk, perhaps, uh, but I think that it's absolutely fundamental about a proper understanding of what financialization actually is. And uh, I don't see financialization as the creation of a sort of autonomous sphere of finance that extracts value from the productive economy, and that's that there's actually a very complex way in which finance uh, becomes um, completely subsumed, or, or industry becomes completely subsumed uh, under sort of a, a logic of accumulation that is dominated by finance. Um, and the two sort of stand in much more complex relationships with one another uh, than is commonly assumed. Uh, and so you see that one of the things that I really focus on in the book is this concept of spillover costs. And the spillover costs of default tend to operate through multiple channels. They operate, first of all, through the financial channel, uh, collapse of the banking system, bank runs, uh, collapse of pension funds, and things I mentioned, but they also operate through the industries uh, in the sense that when industries can't obtain credit, um, like trade credit, they can't engage in imports and exports. Uh, and so what you see in Greece, for instance, when it was cut off in 2015 from uh, external financing by the ECB uh, and the domestic banking system uh, had basically froze up, uh, industry also, industrial production also collapsed in that moment. So you have indicators actually showing that during the months, summer months of 2015, Greek industry almost ground to a halt. And very similar things happened in the short term in Argentina following its default. So there's a real sort of risk that the ramifications of a default will spread over into industry. And that, those are crucial sort of uh, costs to take into account in uh, determining why it is that governments don't default. 
It's something that I do look at in the book, but I didn't get to in the, in the presentation. Uh, so thanks for raising that. Okay. Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, one, one first practical question. You know, in Tunisia, we don't have access to your kind of book. So did you bring your book with you so we can buy it or not? Uh, <laughs> unfortunately, the, the publisher didn't give me uh, any books to sell. Uh, okay. So <laughs> okay, I have one example <laughs> with me. But send me an email and we'll arrange something. Okay, okay thank yeah. you. So the, the, the question is, you said that the IMF is kind of protecting private, um, private creditors. But also, for example, in Tunisia, the, the European Union, when they lend to Tunisia, to Tunisia, it's on IMF conditions. So mm. who is behind the, the IMF? Uh, who is behind IMF? Is it only private creditors or also public creditors? And the, the second question is, is for a country like Tunisia, is it more, do we have more leverage when we do default? Is it more risky to do default on private uh, creditors or on public creditors? Because from my, from my perspective, like the Private creditors, they won't send us like the military if we don't if we if we do default. So is it like maybe better to do like private private credit as a country? So this is the the question. Also, you spoke about uh, a cartel. Do you speak about the, for example, the example of uh, the club of Paris, the club de Paris? What's the role of these kind of clubs of creditors? Because whenever there is a restructuring of debt, we always speak about club of Paris. But the the role of club of Paris, it's not very clear. Uh, a third question is about the leverage of debt because we know that we know. Sorry, I ask a lot of questions, but we know we know that there is, for example, when we there is a leverage behind this uh, this debt. So when we do default, the impact of the default is also leverage. So we also have a lot of power when we do default because the infliction is much higher with all these derivative mar markets. So do you think that we, as also like uh, like like countries like Tunisia, do have more power when we do when we do default? And the last question, and maybe it's a small technical question, but you know, I was I was involved in uh, debt audit uh, like uh, <laughs> campaign. So we know this uh, example of Ecuador and who has did this debt audit and restructuring, etc. But I was very like I wanted to know if you if you investigated the role of these banks who are helping these countries to do this negotiation like uh, Lazar. I don't know if you know Lazar because uh, maybe Maher knows also, but Lazar also contacted Tunisia because there were a discussion about defaulting here also in Tunisia doing a debt audit. And what is the role of these banks? Are they, all, are they really like uh, trying to help these countries or are they also a member of the cartel? Thank you. Okay. Uh, we can take two more questions. Okay. Since I have the mic, I may okay. actually continue. Uh, you, have to, you have the mic already, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, then we'll take, uh, we'll take this, uh, this two still. Okay. Um, yeah, nice try, your, your explanation. But I think it's somehow a little bit uh, yeah, apart from, the, from reality. So the first, uh, it was, this is just the first remark, and I will restrict myself to the case of Greece. The first remark is that the, I doubt that there was any payment of or re rejection of debt by repayment of loans in the last 50 years. The only reduction, reduction of debt we saw is by debt relief uh, agreements. So what, we, what has been presented a few uh, one day, yesterday or the day before. So, but. Any other country has has never reduced its debt. What what, what we see is paying payment of interest. So this is the, this is very good to be seen in Greece. Greece, there is also no national debt, no domestic debt. If you are in a currency zone, the currency zone actually defines the economic space in which the whole economy economy functions. Although. The, 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 the EU administration is trying to ignore this, and, the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the, let's say the better off countries like Germany and the, the general, the, the EU North, they say, okay, we don't bail out our governments in the South. Please keep but, the question short. Yeah, I, I, this is actually, I'm actually there already. And so this means there's no internal debt. And what happened in Greece is not that the banks had internal debts and could not pay. And so, because the, the European Central Bank is actually their central bank, but disciplines them. And so by, by actually cutting them off from any money supply. So last word, 
and the and the so-called uh, troika opposed uh, that uh, uh, or say save saving or try to save the Greek's economy attempts are simply continuing the dead stock. The dead stock will be will not be reduced and pay the interest rate. So meaning that what what they achieve is to increase is just to pay the interest rate, but to keep the stock on the same level, and it will continue forever. So there is no bad repayment at all, and they will be, uh, uh, let's say, colonialized by the uh, uh, European Central Bank. Okay. So th I think you have got it somehow, you got to come to okay. a different vision. We still have uh, one here and one here. This Max, who is raising it first. Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, I thought it's compelling, but my concern is that it lapsed into a kind of um, teleology and sometimes an economism. I mean, I think what needs to be included in the explanation is both the decline and also the assault on anti-systemic ideology and practice as it congeals in national developmental projects. I mean, there aren't very many alternative sources of finance in the world system. The ones that do exist, okay, it's China, I don't consider it anti-systemic. Um, and any state that tries to carry out a unilateral default is going to be in big trouble in the world system in the absence of a united front of states that are carrying out uh, unilateral defaults on their debt. And this is because of a concerted imperialist assault on any sort of ideology and practice that tries to carry it out. I mean, I think that's very important to include in the analysis, um, especially in places where we are actually talking about ways of reconstituting such forms of resistance. Okay, and we have Anna. Uh, yes, I wondered, uh, since you mentioned those uh, unilateral debt defaults at the beginning of the 19th century, uh, I wonder whether like domestic agents were like less less inclined to hold like sovereign bonds, or how come that you know was had like less deleterious uh, implications for for those economies at the time to have like a sovereign debt default. Okay, I would let uh, Jerome answer. Okay, so I'm gonna have to be brief because there's a lot here and, and some of these questions are really excellent. Um, so who's behind the IMF? I think it's a big story. I don't think I wanna sort of get into that in depth because there's a huge scholarly debate around the determinants of IMF policy that's by no means settled. Um, but it's obvious that there is one power with veto power, one country with veto power, uh, that's the U.S. government, and uh, together with its European Japanese allies, it is basically able to um, influence most IMF policy. Um, private creditors have no direct channels to the IMF. So when I say that the IMF defends creditors' interests, I don't mean to say that that's because there's some kind of conspiracy at the level where private creditors influence the IMF directly. What I mean to say is that the IMF fulfills, because of what it does, a certain role within the world economy that ends up being to the systematic advantage of private creditors. Um, that is partly a result of the way that the official creditor governments of Europe and the United States have strategically reoriented the IMF in the wake of the Mexican um, crisis of 1982. So especially under the Baker Plan, for instance, uh, there was a very aggressive attempt by the US government and its allies to change the way that the IMF functions. Uh, specifically to gear it more towards uh, the enforcement of debt contracts. Uh, so that's one. Um, there was a question there. I'm not going to be able to answer all questions of yours because there were five and they were really good, but I won't be able to do justice to them all. Um, just very quickly, the Club of Paris, uh, it's slightly different. Well, it's very different from the private creditors cartel because those are the um, creditor countries themselves uh, and the public debt that they hold. So if there's a restructuring of the Paris Club debt, that basically means that there's a restructuring of the debt that is held, for instance, by the French government or um, by other sort of official creditors, right? So that's not, doesn't involve privately held debt. Um, default as leverage. I do think that sovereign default can be a form of leverage that you don't have when you don't default. And why is that? I mean, look at Argentina as, a, as an example of that. The moment Argentina defaulted, in 2001, it incurred massive costs for that domestically. But when it maintained that default for several years, it also squeezed its foreign bondholders. And because they weren't receiving any money on their investments for about three years, by the time that 2005 came around and Argentina was in a better place and had recovered economically, 
And when it went back and said, okay, now we're going to renegotiate the debt, those creditors had been receiving zero cents on the dollar for three years. Now imagine a scenario in which they'd been receiving 100 cents on the dollar for three years. And now imagine where you're going to settle in terms of your restructuring. Is someone who's receiving 100 cents on the dollar going to settle for 30 cents on the dollar? It's unlikely. But is someone who is receiving zero cents on the dollar for three years going to be willing to accept 30 cents? It's more likely. Right? So if you're able to sort of maintain a, debt a payment suspension for a long time, you alter the logic of calculation um, of the private creditor because they're always looking forward to future profits. Right? They're looking forward to future profits, and if they're making zero right now, then 30 will at least allow them to recover something right? and, and mark the remaining debt to market, as it's called. Uh, so that is definitely one way in which a default can increase your leverage. But again, as I said before, there's many ways in which those defaults are discouraged. And one of them is through those domestic spillover costs that tend to be very extreme. And so the Argentine case is an example of that. And I think, you know, while it's good that they defaulted for the Argentine case uh, specifically, uh, they did incur costs for that, and we shouldn't uh, sort of underestimate those. Right? Um, then you mentioned uh, Ecuador. I think Ecuador is a very interesting example again. Uh, I don't know enough about Lazar um, to, to make a more specific comment on that. But they are not technically part of the creditors' cartel. They are part of international finance, as it were. Uh, but they're not part of the creditors' cartel in the sense that they are not directly lending to these governments. They're making their money from, um, well, in this case, uh, from uh, advising fees, I presume. Right? I don't know the Ecuadorian case well enough. Uh, but I know that you know, there's Rothschild, uh, sovereign debt management, does the same thing. They basically advise governments on how to restructure their debts and deal with these problems. And they make their money from that. They don't actually hold the debt themselves. Um, then further questions about, uh, let's see. Um, there was a question here that I, I didn't really understand uh, the, the nature of the question, so I'm not sure how to respond to that. Um, there was a question there in the back about anti, sort of, or what did you say again? Imperialist, anti-systemic anti movements have been crushed by imperialist resistance. Is that the, the nature of what you were trying to say? No, no, I'm just trying to remember. Uh, Alternative state projects are systematically crushed. I mean, the Latin American governments are not able to congeal into a national, into a continental uh, development bank that would actually be able to lend on preferential terms, and that is actually the result of an actual practice of imperialist aggression on the continent. So, insofar as we think, okay, we're not, we're seeing a decline of sovereign de uh, defaults and it's becoming to almost 0% of sovereign debt, uh, we need to think about that in terms of an overall structure of power. Absolutely. Right? That's, and, okay, so now I understand um, your, your point, and actually I would say I'm completely in agreement with that. There's no disagreement between us in that respect. Uh, actually, what I, I would say is that the 1980s are a very good illustration of that um, type of imperialist uh, power being wielded directly in order to force countries to repay. And that's why I also invoked uh, the legacy of Thomas Sankara uh, in this respect. Um, then there was the last question about domestic ownership. Uh, I do think that that's absolutely sort of one of the major differences, right? So what has happened in the more recent period with the rise of the financial sectors in the debtor countries in the global south uh, is that there's been an increase in domestic ownership of debt um, inside many debtor countries. And that raises those spillover costs of default. Uh, and therefore, it is one, is yet another way in which debtor discipline is sort of internalized into the state apparatus of these debtor countries. Um, so that's definitely something to keep in mind as well. Um, and I'll leave it at that. Okay? Thank you, uh, Jerome. Uh, we will continue with uh, the presentation of Ndongo Sambasila and uh, Kai Kodenberg, who will speak about monetary dependence in the long durée. Uh, Ndongo, you already... Um, <laughs> heard him on the pre-conference event. Uh, Ndongo is a Senegalese development economist. Uh, he has previously worked as a technical advisor to the presidency of the Republic of Senegal. He's also a project manager at the Dakar office of the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation. Um, and uh, Kai Kodenbrock, uh, who is also an acting professor in international political studies at the University of Wittenherdecke in Germany. He currently works on money, finance, and dependency with a particular focus on the franc CFA. 
Uh, his main research interests are the problem of unequal exchange and how it relates to value and the contemporary theory of imperialism. Right. Um, thanks so much. We have a little presentation. Um, so I think, um, so it was not by coincidence that um, Jerome, Dongo and me uh, are on the same panel because we all wanted to tackle the long durée aspect of monetary and financial dependency in, in some way. And um, it's very interesting what Jerome said because uh, in his talk about the 19th century, he said that there was some, so somehow more liberty, more leeway, more policy space for the governments. And our talk, I think, uh, connects nicely to that because it seems that particular ways of uh, increasing capitalist integration in the capitalist market have actually massively decreased that um, sovereignty in the end. But before uh, Ndongo and I, and we've been collaborating for a few years now, uh, jo present our joint talk, we want to summarize a little bit what for us were some of the main points of the conference because as you all suffered and we suffered as well it was such an intense and long program that we had little um, time to step back and synthesize a little bit so here we picked just some of the few points that we thought were relevant in our debate so far so Tony Bang who was saying yesterday that uh, African countries were not born sovereign but have to conquer it Fadel making this argument and we're making very short and stylized summaries obviously so sorry if you feel um, badly summarized, to include state spending and decrease trade dependency through new ways of organizing food, housing, and energy. Prabhat's uh, argument that neoliberalism is at a dead end because the state is no longer able to prevent ex ante overproduction. Heiner Flussbeck's uh, uh, intriguing talk about the relevance of the three prices, or in the case of developing uh, countries, the four prices, and how they have been distorted and never right, and that the aim should be derived at some sort of stability of them for developing countries. Cedric, who has unfortunately already left, um, that building domestic financial markets to reduce credit repression uh, would be essential. And uh, Chibuikwe was arguing that actually the problem of Nigeria in the post-colonial phase was not some kind of structural disadvantage or lack of sovereignty, but the lack of skill in, uh, in managing reserves. And Daniela's yesterday forceful talk, uh, among other things, advising us that engaging in uh, deals with international finance and the World Bank and PPPs is not a very good idea and has to absolutely be resisted. What we take from that is that there are four suggestions that, that come from some of these and many other great proposals during this uh, conference to de-link by, for example, reducing imports and exports, to improve domestic creation of finance through government direction and of banking and re the real sector, to resist further integration into global circuits of capital, and to devise alternative forms of economic and monetary integration. So these seem to be some of the key points that have uh, surfaced for us during the conference. And with our historical analysis of monetary dependency, we will um, try to make a case, and reaching until today, how that um, problem has arrived and what spaces have potentially developed uh, to implement this program. So I would say that Jerome's talk was very nice uh, about finance and debt, so that what, what financial dependency means in the long durée. And we will be focusing, or at least in my short part of the, of the presentation, I will be focusing on the monetary part. So the relevance of money and currency for the decre decrease of sovereignty and ongoing dependency. So what we do is we use African history as a basis for general discussion of monetary dependency and its relation to trade and the domestic economy. It builds on a short paper Ndongo and I have written recently, which is called the Towards the Political Economy of Monetary Dependency, the case of the France CFA in West Africa. In this paper, we use the work of the uh, early uh, the, the scholar Joseph Chunjiang Puemi, a Cameroonian scholar who worked for the IMF, and died prematurely after just publishing this book, Money, Servitude, and Liberty. And this book is quite good in, in linking the foreign or international dimension of monetary dependency and the internal dimension. And we argue in the paper that it would make sense, although it's only available in French, 
to deal with his work because it can also shed new light on what is happening today. Um, so what is monetary dependency? I would say very generally under capitalism all classes, societies and governments interact through commodity and money exchange. So there's just very generally a dependence on money. But the analytical challenge is to understand uh, its distributive power and to make that money and the exchange of commodities work for the majority of the people. And in our analysis, we want to go through four phases, and I will mainly talk about the first one. So from the slave trade to colonialism, colonialism in Africa, the age of neocolonialism, and the age of globalization, and how monetary dependency and the dependence on uh, trade interact and uh, reduce the sovereignty of the states and societies involved. So my, my task is now to make uh, this monetary dependency conception a bit more tangible, and I want to go back to a very classic locus uh, that has been mentioned by Jan Kregel in his talk, but all before that also by Marx and Ingham, because Although there's many monetary economists in this room here, uh, I think it's, all, it's still relevant to, to talk about the system or the logic that has been established with the Bank of England, which is like, was considered by most as the, most, uh, as the first modern central bank, and which had also installed the, um, the instrument or institution of the government bond. Because what happened there in 1694 is that William III needed money to fight the French, so the grandiose uh, Louis XIV, they were in, in, at war and he didn't have money, so he needed to, to create funds to finance his war, and that's when the Bank of England uh, came into existence, which is basically, at the beginning, was a fund of 1.2 million sterling that the landed aristocracy and the rising bourgeoisie from London lent, put into that fund, and... Uh, what the king only had to promise is that he has to pay back 10% of this fund every year as a perpetual bond. Paying back the basis of this fund was not, not really the issue because the, debtor, or the creditors knew the king would be able to pay these 10% every year because he had already developed a uh, capacity to tax his population. Tax administrations were uh, in ascendancy. So there was a three-party deal coming into existence between the crown between the rich, let's say, and the, the population that is being um, taxed, which allowed um, the creation of money, because this fund was not just as a, as a deposit that was given out, but it was then able to increase the amount of money in circulation uh, based on that fund. And um, this is, I think, the national nature of, of capitalist money, which is always, all the discussions about domestic banking system, domestic finance, always boil down to a three-party deal between these stylized actors. So the people, the rich, and the government, the rich uh, and, and, and banking uh, sector. So they um, engage in a mutual dependency to make a domestic money and domestic credit creation work. Without that kind of deal, um, capitalist money doesn't work. But that's a national story. So um, the international uh, story is one in which and it was mentioned several times uh, during this conference, the fact of engaging with the rest of the world, the fact of international trades, um, brings with it the functional need of a dominant currency that assumes the role of a valued commodity in itself. So Jan Kregel, for example, was talking about how this works logically when there's different payment systems. I would like to stress that um, once you engage in international trade, that money that is mostly used to make that possible becomes a commodity in itself that needs to be imported to be able to engage in that kind of trade. So you can only engage with the rest of the world if you somehow get access to that money that is accepted as payment for this engagement um, with the rest of the world. And um, this idea has been very relevant to study the 19th century history of West Africa. Um, which is where our uh, talks here intersect. Because um, if you go back to this idea that um, the capitalist logic, basically, and how it emerges and evolved over time, is at the heart of what governments and public actors and the people can do, uh, the origin of uh, capitalism as a starting point of that increasing 
decrease of uh, what you want to do and the, the, the lack of policy space or the lack of self-determination people have. The West African slave trade is key because as global history has shown and people like Walter Rodney and others, uh, Du Bois, uh, the slave trade was essential for the rise of Britain. It was not just industrialization and all that. So here, um, and but the slave trade uh, was affected in Mali and Nigeria um, through the cowrie shell in the 19th century, in the 18th century. Um, here you have an image of uh, how many slaves between 1501 and 1866 were exported from West Africa to which areas of the world. And this is the area where this cowrie shell was used to be able to sell slaves. So this exact idea that um, to be able to export that which is valued outside of your own country, you need to be, have a currency um, that somebody else accepts, started to emerge in that time, but was not yet as um, coercive as it was when official colonialism started. Because the cowrie shell here was harvested um, in the Maldives, in today's uh, near, close to near, near in, uh, India, and then exported on via Rotterdam, Amsterdam, and London over to West Africa, and used um, as the payment for slaves. But it was something that was not, um, this is what been, has been uh, discussed by John Haragondon and Marion Johnson in the Shell Money of the Slave Trade. Um, it was not a currency that was imposed, like the sterling or the franc and the franc CFA, but uh, for some reason, especially in West Africa, because they already had the trans-Saharian uh, trade routes in the 11th, 12th, 13th, and 14th century, um, there was some demand for this kind of uh, money uh, for, to export their slaves. Which means um, it was, in West Africa, not yet the compulsion of capitalism, which then arrived with the end of the 19th century and the 20th century when Sterling and the Franc Franc and the Franc CFA later on, for example, had to be imposed. But there was still this kind of demand component of, of money. So uh, the West African rulers and traders and the people using it most more or less chose to use the cowrie to engage in, uh, in the export of, of slaves. But that changed uh, massively once the French and the British uh, started to uh, engage in territorial colonialism because they displaced the use of the cowrie shell and made everybody use their currency. Um, so similarly to what Jerome was saying about uh, the debt uh, default, this kind of leeway in engaging uh, in the kind of trade that the people in West Africa wanted to engage in um, re was reduced and has been going on until today. So now we have dollar dependency, we have now maybe, maybe a diversification of uh, dependency with the arrival of China, but um, structurally uh, the space to, to use the kind of money for the exchange that you want to use has been massively reduced. And I run over to Ndongo who will talk about the second part of our talk. Thanks, Kai. So I'll switch to French. <laughs> yeah. Um, je vais essayer en fait de en fait suivant ce que Kai a dit de parler de la dépendance monétaire en partant du disons de l'expérience coloniale. Et donc le point de vue sera beaucoup plus euh, analytique euh, qu'historique. Et euh, l'objectif en fait aussi c'est de d'avoir euh, une discussion avec euh, la théorie monétaire moderne par rapport à sa définition de la, de la souveraineté monétaire. Et donc, le premier point, en fait, qu'on voudrait dire, c'est qu'en fait, il y a deux faces à la, à, la, à la question de la dépendance monétaire. La dépendance monétaire peut être vue comme un phénomène euh, sui generis, c'est-à-dire comme l'intégration subordonnée dans un système monétaire global impérialiste. C'est en fait en soi. Mais la, la, la dépendance monétaire peut aussi être un phénomène dérivé, 
c'est-à-dire euh, comme la contrepartie ou le résultat, disons, de la, de la dépendance économique. Et euh, parce qu'en fait, le fait d'avoir, disons, une certaine souveraineté monétaire formelle, par exemple, le fait que certains pays aient, disons, rompu sur le plan monétaire avec les puissances coloniales et que ces pays aient commencé à émettre leur propre monnaie avec leur banque centrale, euh, c'est la souveraineté monétaire formelle. Mais ça ne veut pas forcément dire, en fait, que ces pays sont souverains réellement sur le, sur le plan monétaire. Et donc, le fait d'avoir une souveraineté monétaire formelle, en fait, n'est pas suffisant pour progresser, en fait, sur le spectre, disons, de la souveraineté monétaire. Et donc, euh, avoir une souveraineté économique, c'est important pour avoir plus de souveraineté monétaire, mais également avoir un minimum en termes de souveraineté monétaire est nécessaire pour avoir plus de souveraineté économique. Donc, c'est des points globaux que, que nous faisons et que nous essayons, en fait, d'illustrer à travers l'évolution historique. Et donc, le premier modèle, en fait, analytique, c'est le modèle économique colonial. En fait, dans le modèle économique colonial, en fait, il y a une interrogation monétaire et financière totale entre les colonies et la métropole. Et donc, cette intégration monétaire se, se réalise, en fait, par... Le, un taux de change fixe avec la monnaie métropolitaine, une convertibilité illimitée avec la monnaie métropolitaine, une liberté de transfert des capitaux et des revenus. En fait, le fait aussi d'avoir une même législation des changes que, que la métropole, mais aussi le fait que la métropole contrôle les réserves de change, disons, des, des, des colonies. Et donc, ça, c'est une intégration monétaire totale. Et donc, quand dans, dans les colonies, on voit des billets de banque ou des pièces de, de monnaie, en fait, c'était la même monnaie que la monnaie métropolitaine, en fait. Donc, euh, disons que les colonies étaient monétairement intégrées au, au, à, à leur métropole. Et donc, l'objectif, en fait, de l'intégration monétaire et financière dans le cadre colonial, en fait, c'est de faciliter, disons, le rapatriement, le rapatriement des profits, mais aussi l'investissement des entreprises euh, métropolitaines avec, euh, disons, aussi euh, l'objectif de réduire les risques en termes de, euh, disons, variation du, du taux de change, risque de change, et aussi euh, pour prévenir, disons, des situations, disons, de pénurie de devises. Donc, il faut à tout moment que les entreprises métropolitaines puissent rapatrier euh, leurs profits. Et donc, l'intégration bancaire dans le cadre colonial, en fait, euh, revient à donner aux banques métropolitaines, en fait, le pouvoir, disons, de contrôler le, la création des crédits et l'allocation de crédits. Et donc, quel est le rôle du secteur bancaire dans le cadre colonial C'est pas de faciliter le développement. Au contraire, en fait, c'est de faciliter la mobilité des, des capitaux, des colonies vers, vers, vers la métropole et vice versa, de financer le secteur disons, extractif, disons, le secteur de l'exportation et notamment de l'exportation, disons, des produits primaires, mais aussi de faciliter euh, l'importation de produits de luxe pour les classes, disons, moyennes et les classes supérieures pour créer une demande pour les produits métropolitains. Mais aussi le secteur bancaire, historiquement, par exemple, dans les pays africains, en tout cas dans la zone franc, a eu pour rôle, en fait, de protéger le capitalisme métropolitain contre, disons, la con concurrence, disons, des entreprises euh, locales, euh, indigènes, etc. Parce qu'en fait, ces banques n'accordaient jamais de crédit aux entreprises euh, indigènes qui pouvaient concurrencer les entreprises métropolitaines. Ça a été le rôle historique euh, du, du secteur bancaire, disons, dans les colonies. Et donc, euh, à cette intégration monétaire financière, à l'intégration bancaire, il y a aussi une intégration de type euh, commercial. Et donc, c'est ce qu'on a appelé généralement le, le pacte colonial. Et donc, le pacte colonial, ce n'est pas un contrat. C'est, disons, euh, des relations économiques coloniales qui conduisent au fait que euh, les colonies ne doivent pas s'industrialiser. Elles doivent juste euh, euh, se spécialiser dans la production, disons, et l'exploitation de matières premières qui sont transformées en métropole et qui reviennent sous forme de produits finis. Et donc, ces produits également sont transportés par, disons, les euh, navires euh, de la métropole, etc. Donc, ça veut dire qu'en fait, euh, le développement des colonies est complémentaire avec le développement, disons, de la métropole. Et donc, euh, c'est ça un peu le, le pacte colonial. Ça, ça veut dire qu'il euh, ne faut pas s'industrialiser. Et donc, l'objectif, c'est juste de produire des, euh, des, des, les, les matières premières dont les euh, industries métropolitaines euh, ont besoin. Et donc, dans le cadre du modèle colonial, évidemment, c'est la force militaire et le droit colonial qui permettraient d'assurer cet ordre. Et donc, on peut résumer en dire que dans le modèle économique colonial, en fait, ce qui se passe, c'est qu'il y a une intégration monétaire totale entre, disons, la métropole 
et les colonies, ou en tout cas les territoires sous dépendance, disons, de la métropole. Et il y a aussi une forme d'intégration économique et, coloniale, et commerciale avancée entre les colonies et la métropole. Donc, d'une certaine manière, c'est comme ça qu'on peut euh, résumer le modèle économique euh, colonial. Et donc, on peut dire grosso modo qu'en fait, c'est ça qui s'est passé en Afrique, disons, entre 1900 et 1960, si on reste en fait sur les schémas analytiques. Après, après euh, 1960, au moment des indépendances, on bascule à un autre modèle. Donc, c'est le modèle économique euh, néocolonial. Et là, nous avons deux variantes. Donc, la première variante, c'est, disons, euh, le modèle des pays qui utilisent le franc CFA. C'est-à-dire qu'en en fait, on continue toujours le modèle économique euh, colonial avec très peu de variations. Euh, les variations, c'est qu'en fait, euh, par exemple, dans le cadre euh, des pays qui utilisent le franc CFA, euh, en fait, dans le cadre de l'intégration euh, européenne, donc les, ex les ex-puissances coloniales européennes se sont dites euh, « maintenant, on fait euh, le libre-échange entre nous et aussi il faut supprimer les barrières euh, coloniales » qui existait entre nous. Donc, il faut qu'on ait, disons, le même empire, mais non plus français, britannique, portugais ou belge, mais un empire européen qui est une annexe, disons, de l'Europe. Donc, c'est leur Africa. Et donc, c'est ça qui a un peu changé dans le cas de ces pays-là. Et dans le cas des pays CFA également, il y a eu une volonté, disons, euh, d'avoir des banques nationales, en fait, de rendre le secteur bancaire, disons, euh, en fait, de mobiliser le secteur bancaire pour le développement, disons, de ces pays. Et donc, euh, les instruments qui ont été utilisés pour, disons, maintenir cet ordre, c'est par exemple les accords de coopération. Par exemple, dans le cas des pays qui ont le franc CFA, au moment de leur indépendance, en fait, euh, ils ont signé avec la France des accords de coopération disant que euh, maintenant, euh, voilà, vous avez la souveraineté politique formelle, mais vous restez dans la zone franc, les matières premières sont contrôlées par la France et que vous ne pouvez pas les vendre à une autre puissance sans le consentement de la France, etc. Mais par la suite, ça n'était plus possible dans le cadre européen. Et donc, c'est là qu'on a commencé à avoir les accords commerciaux, Lomé, Cotonou, etc., pour en fait européaniser le, le pacte colonial. Et donc, c'est un peu ça ce qui s'est passé. Mais dans le cas de ces pays-là, il n'y a même pas du tout de, de souveraineté monétaire formelle. Il n'y en a pas. Et donc, la deuxième variante, c'est le cas des pays qui, euh, à la suite de la colonisation, en fait, à la suite de leur indépendance, ont commencé à émettre leur propre monnaie nationale, banque centrale, etc. Comme le cas, par exemple, de la Tunisie et du Maroc qui ont quitté la zone franc pour avoir leur propre monnaie nationale. Et ces pays, qu'est-ce qu'ils ont fait Ils se sont déconnectés tout de suite sur le plan monétaire. Banque, banque centrale, euh, autonome, euh, gestion, réserve, gestion autonome des réserves de change, on, fixe, on supprime la fixité de la parité avec la monnaie métropolitaine, on installe un contrôle d'échange, des contrôles des capitaux, et on essaie, disons, d'indigéniser en fait, le, le secteur bancaire. Et donc, dans le cas de ces pays-là, tel a été un peu le modèle, parce qu'en fait, ils voulaient avoir beaucoup plus d'indépendance vis-à-vis de la, de la métropole, de l'ex-métropole, et aussi mobiliser les ressources domestiques pour le développement. Mais en fait, ils ont acquis une souveraineté monétaire formel, mais ils ne sont pas, disons, déconnectés du système euh, monétaire euh, mondial. Et donc, ces pays aussi ont essayé d'avoir plus d'autonomie sur le plan, disons, commercial, en mettant en place, disons, des barrières tarifaires vis-à-vis -vis euh, de l'ancienne puissance coloniale et d'autres pays. Ça veut dire qu'aussi, les espaces étaient déconnectés. Donc, euh, ces ex-colonies n'étaient plus, disons, des annexes périphériques euh, sur le plan commercial de leur euh, métropole. Et donc, l'objectif ici aussi, c'est d'avoir une euh, certaine autonomie sur le plan de la politique commerciale et aussi de diversifier les, les, les partenariats. Et donc, là également, le type d'instrument utilisé pour maintenir cet ordre, c'était les accords commerciaux, mais aussi les accords bilatéraux d'investissement, l'aide au développement, les... Euh, prêts et conditionnalités du FMI, la Banque mondiale et aussi les interventions militaires sélectives dans, dans, dans certains pays. De sorte qu'on peut définir le, le néocolonialisme comme, disons, la coexistence entre une indépendance formelle, mais avec des formes avancées et renouvelées d'intégration subordonnée avec les anciennes métropoles. C'est une définition qu'on peut avoir du du néocolonialisme. Et donc, dans les pays qui sont dans ce modèle économique néocolonial, ils ont une souveraineté monétaire qui est form juste formelle et qui résulte, en fait, euh, de leur dépendance euh, économique. Donc, c'est ce que je disais tout à l'heure. Vous pouvez avoir euh, une indépendance euh, 
monétaire formel, sui generis, mais vous n'êtes pas réellement souverain sur le plan monétaire parce que vous, vous êtes toujours dépendant sur le plan économique. Et donc, vous avez euh, encore cinq minutes. D'accord. Et donc, on a le modèle économique euh, globaliste, en fait, qui commence à partir des années 90. Et donc, euh, là, là, pour aller vite, hein, c'est le triomphe de la, de la finance, de la sound finance, des banques centrales indépendantes, euh, pas de monétisa monétisation des déficits publics, euh, faible inflation, déficit public faible, etc., privatisation des entreprises... Euh, ouvrir les marchés domestiques à la concurrence étrangère, s'intégrer davantage dans le marché mondial, dans le marché financier mondial et s'intégrer davantage dans le système commercial mondial à travers les accords de l'OMC, les politiques de libéralisation financière, etc. Et dans ce cadre, en fait, le rôle, c'est un peu de rendre la finance, en fait, de rendre le monde, en fait, plus sûr pour la finance mondiale, c'est-à-dire garantir plus ou moins les la libre mobilité des, des capitaux, des biens et des services et euh, assurer que les, taux de profit, les, les profits peuvent être, faits dans les, peuvent être faits dans les pays euh, pauvres et être rapatriés euh, sans problème. Et donc, de sorte qu'on peut définir euh, le globalisme, la mondialisation, comme une forme de colonialisme multilatéral, mais déguisé. C'est-à-dire qu'actuellement, on est à une phase où le colonialisme, en fait, a un caractère abstrait. C'est-à-dire qu'on a des pays qui sont là, qui disent être souverains, mais en fait, qui sont comme des formes de colonies, parce que même s'ils ne sont pas forcément dominés sur le plan militaire, ils sont enchaînés par une série d'accords euh, qu'ils ont pris, et donc... Euh, qui véritablement, en fait, limite l'espace qu'ils ont en termes de politique euh, économique. Et donc, euh, souvent, euh, les économistes ont tendance à parler de la dette. Moi, j'ai plutôt tendance à mettre l'accent sur les transferts de, de profit en, en, en Afrique. Et généralement, c'est, euh, en fait, euh, un domaine où, en fait, un domaine auquel on ne prête pas souvent attention. Et pour moi, qui, quelque part, est l'une un, des raisons expliquant pourquoi parfois les, Afri les États africains s'endettent en monnaie étrangère et souvent dans des proportions indépendantes. Et ce qu'il explique, c'est que dans ces pays-là, généralement, le système bancaire fonctionne toujours comme au temps colonial. Il est dysfonctionnel, c'est-à-dire qu'il n'y a pas de finances pour le secteur privé national. Et donc, il n'y a pas de finances aussi pour les États. Et donc, ce qui se passe, c'est qu'il y a une faible croissance des marchés domestiques. Et donc, ça, ça accroît la propension à importer. Et donc, ça aussi euh, favorise le fait que les États s'endettent en monnaie euh, étrangère ou essaient, disons, d'attirer de manière désespérée les investissements directs étrangers. Et donc, dans la plupart de ces pays aussi, euh, les secteurs économiques clés sont contrôlés par le capital étranger. Et du coup, la contrepartie, c'est qu'il y a des transferts euh, importants de, de profits euh, chaque année. Et ça aussi crée, comme le secteur euh, productif euh, national est bloqué, donc ça a tendance à se répercuter sur la balance commerciale parce que on est, ces pays importent plus qu'ils n'exportent. Parfois, lorsqu'ils ont des surplus, c'est parce que les termes de l'échange se sont améliorés. Mais dans tous les cas, ce qu'il y a, c'est qu'il y a un poste qui est constant, c'est les transferts nets de revenus à l'étranger, c'est-à-dire les intérêts qui sont payés sur la dette externe, mais aussi le rapatriement des, des profits et, et dividendes. Il y a aussi les fuites des capitaux et qui sont alimentés également par la préférence des, des les classes dirigeantes qui préfèrent généralement euh, détenir leurs actifs financiers en monnaie étrangère. Et donc là, je vais donner quelques exemples rapidement, en fait, euh, disons, euh, des transferts nets de revenus du continent africain entre 2000 et 2010. Ce qui est intéressant dans ce graphique, c'est qu'on peut voir qui sont les pays, euh, en fait, les zones impérialistes et les pays, euh, disons, qui payent un tribut au reste du monde. Là, les, les transferts nets de revenus, c'est les... Euh, disons, les revenus qui sont trans transférés moins les revenus qui sont reçus. Et donc, les revenus, c'est les intérêts sur la dette externe, c'est les rapatriements de profits pour l'essentiel. Et donc, on voit, par exemple, que l'Afrique euh, Afrique subsaharienne, là, entre 2000 et 2010, avait versé vers le reste du monde, en termes nets, 405 milliards de dollars. Et donc, c'est plus, par exemple, que, que l'eurozone en termes nets, trois fois plus à peu près. Et on voit que c'est aussi supérieur à l'Inde et à la Chine. Et donc, euh, là, c'est des chiffres en termes absolus. Par exemple, si on rapporte ça au PIB de la Chine, c'est peut-être 0,1%, c'est rien du tout. Mais par rapport au PIB africain, euh, là, c'est 5%. Et donc, pendant toute cette période, on avait 5% de taux de croissance, mais en moyenne annuelle chaque année, c'est 5% qui était versé vers le reste du monde. Et donc, là, on peut voir aussi qui sont les pays, en fait, entre guillemets, impérialistes. On voit, par exemple, que l'Amérique du Nord... Euh, recevait net des revenus vers le reste du monde. 
euh, notamment euh, les pays OCDE qui sont riches et le, le Japon également, qui reçoit beaucoup de revenus du reste du monde. Donc, euh, on voit clairement que, en fait, euh, ces pays qui ont des monopoles, euh, disons, monopoles financiers de, de grandes banques et qui ont les grandes multinationales qui dominent le secteur de la production mondiale, en fait, reçoivent des quantités colossales d'argent qui viennent du reste du monde. Donc, on voit que tous les pays euh, du Sud, en fait, transfèrent net, disons, des revenus vers le reste du monde. Tous ces pays-là, et même l'eurozone. Ici, l'Asie du Sud-Est, en fait, c'est juste le Japon qui fait que c'est une zone qui reçoit net, euh, disons, des revenus. Mais si on enlève le Japon, donc toutes ces zones-là sont déficitaires. C'est-à-dire que c'est les États-Unis et le Japon qui contrôlent, en fait, tous les intérêts, euh, en fait, sur la dette externe et aussi euh, euh, les rapatriements de profits. Okay. Et donc, I have to ask you to wrap up. Yeah, yeah. Et donc, là, je donne quelques, quelques exemples rapidement, en fait, parce que souvent, on parle des intérêts sur la dette. Mais les rapatriements de profits sont beaucoup plus importants que les intérêts sur la dette. Vous prenez par exemple le Nigeria, c'était 85 milliards de dollars entre 2000 et 2010. Vous prenez la Tunisie, c'est un petit pays, hein, et qui est même beaucoup plus euh, un, un pays qui a une taille beaucoup moins importante que l'Égypte, par exemple, le Maroc, mais, mais la Tunisie versait 11 milliards entre 2000 et 2010. Et si vous regardez les intérêts payés sur la dette, euh, en fait, euh, euh, sur la même période, c'est 8 milliards, donc c'est beaucoup moins. Et donc, souvent, on ne prête pas attention à ces transferts de, de profit. Et donc, là, c'est un, un tableau, en fait, qui montre les taux de profit euh, des, investisse des investisseurs directs étrangers en Afrique. Et donc, vous voyez un pays comme le Botswana, qu'on dit démocratique, bien organisé, les taux de profit euh, des investisseurs directs étrangers en moyenne annuelle sur cette période 2000-2010, c'est 77 À l'échelle mondiale, en 2011, les taux de profit étaient de moins de 5 à l'échelle mondiale. Dans les pays en développement de manière générale, c'est à peu près 8%. Et vous voyez dans plusieurs pays africains, comme par exemple le Botswana, les taux de profit sur des multinationales, c'est 77%. Donc vous voyez que c'est énorme et ça n'a rien à voir avec euh, la dette. Donc euh, je vais conclure rapidement en disant que euh, si on veut faire de véritables progrès en termes de souveraineté économique et monétaire, et il y a des défis à relever dans le secteur réel. C'est-à-dire qu'on ne peut pas se permettre, disons, de continuer les politiques, disons, de libre-échange, de libéralisation financière, maximizing finance for development. Et les projets actuellement, en fait, qu'on dit panafricanistes et qui doivent permettre l'intégration monétaire et économique de l'Afrique, en fait, vont dans le sens du projet globaliste. En fait, c'est-à-dire détérioration des balances courantes via aussi les transferts de profits massifs, etc. Et donc, ce ne sont pas des projets panafricains, mais des projets plutôt afro libéraux. Et donc, juste pour conclure, en fait, la définition euh, de la souveraineté monétaire par la théorie monétaire moderne, elle est, elle est importante. Elle est intéressante, mais il faudrait la revoir dans le cas des pays en voie de développement. Pourquoi Parce que le seul fait d'avoir sa monnaie nationale, même si c'est un taux de change flexible et que les taxes sont perçues dans cette monnaie, ça ne suffit pas à avoir la souveraineté monétaire. Pour avoir euh, une situation de zéro, zéro dette en monnaie étrangère, en fait, c'est pas une question monétaire, c'est une question de politique, euh, en fait, d'économie politique dans, dans, dans le secteur réel. Et donc, pour avoir une véritable souveraineté économique et monétaire, il est crucial d'avoir un contrôle sur le secteur bancaire national et sur le secteur aussi euh, financier. Mais sans cela, on ne peut réellement pas parler de souveraineté monétaire. Merci beaucoup. Okay, so I will take questions, um, but uh, Joan will have to leave us because he has to catch a flight. <laughs> but um, but yeah. uh, he has a website, uh, JeromeRoos.com, and uh, <laughs> yes. Um, so we will have uh, 15 minutes uh, for questions. Uh, who wants to ask something? You. Please keep the questions short. Euh, je vais m'exprimer en français. Euh, voilà. Euh, Lorsqu'on parle de dépendance, euh, d'indépendance monétaire et tout ça, bon, euh, pour, le, pour le long terme, je prends par exemple ce qu'on appelle, comme a fait euh, la communauté économique européenne, c'est-à-dire, fallait-il, par exemple pour l'Afrique, fallait-il une politique monétaire zonale 
C'est-à-dire, euh, comment euh, Je prends par exemple le Maghreb, les échanges, en termes d'échanges des, des ressources, et avec le, ce qu'on appelle la maîtrise de la technologie, donc c'est une zone. L'Afrique, je prends par exemple là, en quatre zones. Bon, ça c'est, disons, il euh, faut un peu du temps, c'est-à-dire dix ans, quelque chose comme ça. Bon, euh, après, c'est ce qu'on appelle, on obtient, euh, disons, la, la, la zone africaine, une zone africaine. Aussi bien, euh, enfin, moyennant des, comment dirais-je, des, des stratégies pour avoir cette zone euh, monétaire africaine. Bon, c'est euh, avec cette force-là, euh, bon, je sais que c'est difficile, mais il fallait y penser pour remédier à des crises économiques, à des, euh, comment dirais-je, c'est-à-dire l'Afrique, en quelque sorte, c'est l'avenir. C'est quelque chose de très important. Donc, il fallait reposer la question dans cette optique-là pour euh, éviter les crises et tout ça, parce que l'Afrique, c'est l'avenir, c'est le futur. Donc, vis-à-vis euh, -vis des autres zones monétaires, en termes d'échange, en termes de, de technologie, en termes de digitalisation et tout ça, donc, c'est une nécessité. Pour pallier à ce que sinon, toujours on reste dans la mer, la, la même tourmente. Donc la souveraineté, en quelque sorte, dépend des échanges entre les zones qui sont plus proches. Le Maghreb, l'Afrique, euh, après, euh, c'est-à-dire vis-à-vis de l'Europe, vis-à-vis de euh, la zone am américaine et tout ça. Donc c'est cette optique-là, c'est une opti optique futuriste, mais nécessaire, en quelque sorte. Okay. Bon, je merci. merci. Donc, um, we have a question here. We have a... No? Okay. <laughs> euh, bonjour, je suis Abir Bikirene. Je, suis... je prépare un mémoire de master en planification urbaine. Ma question, justement, monsieur, par rapport à euh, euh, ce que vous venez de dire, c'est l'export le, 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 des profits. Euh, opérationnellement, comment ça se passe Moi, je parle le cas de la Tunisie parce que vous avez bien, c'est plus que 2000 dollars, si je ne me trompe pas de chiffres. Euh, comment ça se passe réellement Comment se fait ce transfert euh, Une autre question, là, j'ai déjà posé cette question, ça fait trois jours et je n'ai pas encore reçu la réponse. <rire> et c'est pour comment la Tunisie a échappé euh, de, 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 de la zone de... de c'est CFA, oui. Est-ce que cette échappe a fait en contrepartie, c'est-à-dire la Tunisie peut, je ne sais pas, s'assister dans l'état de négociation Je ne serai pas dans cette frange, mais il y a, je donne autre chose. Est-ce que vous avez une idée sur ça Merci. Donc, euh, on a eu une question ici. Thank you very much. Um, the last speaker in his uh, uh, conclusion made a striking uh, observation. Um, he, he said that um, the current uh, um, Pan-African trade, uh, free trade initiative uh, is simply uh, an attempt to achieve a sort of uh, Pan-African globalism and not um, Pan-Africanism indeed. So my question is, is this. Uh, do we really have an earnest Pan-Africanist alternative In that regard. Oui, Fethiha Talaïd du CNRS à Paris. Euh, J'étais intéressée par la typologie, euh, Monsieur Bongo, que vous avez faite euh, pour la dernière période. Mais ce que je voulais dire, c'est que dans le, quand on regarde après les cas concrets, il peut y avoir des cas spécifiques, notamment, bon, moi j'ai travaillé sur le cas de l'Algérie, lorsque par exemple l'afflux de revenus pétroliers fait que on peut euh, reculer un petit peu certaines, euh, certaines échéances. Dans le cas de l'Algérie, par exemple, le, les pays ne s'est pas endetté, euh, n'a pas eu recours donc à la dette extérieure. Euh, mais par contre, euh, j'étais frappée de voir dans vos chiffres qui fait partie des pays. Euh, où les, les, les multinationales ont le plus euh, 
euh, retiré de d'intérêt. De, Donc il y a et puis il y a une pression aussi au niveau de l'opinion, au niveau de la, de la classe politique. Euh, avec les pays où il y a quand même une tradition anti-impérialiste, où, où, où ces changements ne peuvent pas se faire euh, du jour au lendemain. Et, et peut-être, alors ça je, je vous pose la question, ça peut expliquer pourquoi une partie de l'économie fonctionne dans l'informel. C'est-à-dire que ces, ces changements-là, ils peuvent d'abord euh, se faire de manière informelle, de manière illégale même, euh, avant d'être euh, euh, officialisés. Euh, par exemple, en Algérie, le, les... La monnaie n'est pas convertible, mais on a autorisé les gens, les résidents à ouvrir des comptes de vie sans leur demander euh, le, de compte sur enfin, l'origine de ces devises. Et, et dernière, une dernière information, hier, le, la Banque centrale a fait, a, a fait un règlement pour demander aux, aux détenteurs de comptes de vie euh, résidents, enfin, aux détenteurs de comptes de vie de, de donner l'origine de leur devise. Ça, c'est dans le cadre de la lutte contre la corruption. Et tout de suite après, le ministre des Finances contredit cette décision pour dire non, non, ça ne concerne pas les résidents, ça concerne que les étrangers, parce qu'ils ont eu peur que, euh, que les détenteurs de comptes de vise retirent euh, de, de, du jour au lendemain leur devise et les remettent dans l'informel. Donc, bon, il y a, il y a des... Ce que je veux dire, c'est que cette typologie, après, lorsqu'elle est appliquée, euh, est-ce qu'on regarde un peu les cas concrets euh, c'est beaucoup plus compliqué, voilà. Merci. Donc, um, we just had one here because we will give um, we will um, give the microphone first to people who didn't ask any questions uh, yet, and then we still have two there. Merci. Bonjour tout le monde. Euh, je voudrais poser la question à un Monsieur qui euh, qui avait le micro tout à l'heure. Si l'on revient un petit pas dans l'histoire de l'Afrique, surtout. Et l'on essaie d'étudier euh, correctement les peines et l'appauvrissement et qui, qui, qui ont été infligés à l'Afrique, voire euh, dans le sujet de, de, de la traite négrière. Et si je vous pose la question à vous, monsieur, n'y a-t-il jamais eu une étude scientifique exacte sur ces pertes et ces peines qui ont été affligées à l'Afrique pour pouvoir au moins alléger les dettes qui, euh, que l'on endosse aujourd'hui. Et merci. Ok. Two last questions. And... Peut-être une... And oh, oui, je suis là. Yes. Une... Juste une nuance sur la Tunisie. La Tunisie n'a pas réellement repris le contrôle de ses réserves en devises, hein, même après être sorti de la zone. Ben, D'ailleurs, avec la loi 112 qu'on a actuellement, on n'a pas, pas le contrôle sur toutes nos devises jusqu'à maintenant. Donc ça, déjà, c'est la perpétuation aussi de, de, comment dire, de certaines parties, certaines, euh, certains piliers de, du, de la zone franc qui sont encore en cours, même en Tunisie et au Maroc, les deux. Euh, autre chose, quand on parle de, quand on parle de délinking Samir Amin, le, le point crucial, c'est surtout, c'est surtout le, comment dire, la, le free, free movement of capital. C'est ça qu'il faut, ça qu'il faut contrôler. En, en, en l'occurrence, c'est la Tunisie. C'est comme ça qu'elle est sortie, en quelque sorte, de la zone France, en contrôlant les sorties de capitaux. Donc ça, c'est important. Et le dernier point sur l'informel, je pense que ça, c'est très important, surtout en Afrique. C'est qu'aujourd'hui, ce qu'on voit, c'est que la perpétuation des États, c'est des États postcoloniaux, c'est-à-dire que la désarticulation, on est toujours en lien toujours avec, avec la France et l'Union européenne, parce que nos États, ce sont des États qui ont perpétué euh, le système colonial, et il y a une désarticulation des secteurs. L'agriculture, toujours avec l'Europe, l'industrie, toujours avec l'Europe, et les services, toujours avec l'Europe. Mais il n'y a pas de lien entre les trois secteurs au sein de nos pays. Alors que l'informel, quand on voit... Il y a une articulation régionale. Quand on voit le, le, le commerce informel, il est en, train, en réalité en train de faire ce que l'État devrait faire. C'est-à-dire que dans le secteur informel, qu'est-ce qu'ils font Ils font des liens entre les pays africains entre eux. Ils commercent entre eux. Et nous, on est incapable aujourd'hui, en tant qu'État postcoloniaux, de donner les moyens de paiement à nos populations pour qu'ils puissent commercer entre eux, entre pays africains. On est obligé de passer par des devises internationales. Donc la question, c'est comment mettre en place un système qui nous, qui nous permettent de, de, de commercer entre nous sans passer par la métropole. Merci. OK. OK. Yeah. OK. But please keep 
the, quest, uh, the questions short uh, so we can still answer and go into the break. Uh, thank you for the um, uh, slide that showed that monetary sovereignty in developing countries need to be looked at. I think we're all allies here and I think it's a great way for us to take the conversation forward. Uh, secondly, I think that there was some um, underestimation in some of the presentations around the CFTA, the Continental Free Trade Area. And I'm glad you put it up. And just a note for everyone that the Services Negotiations Signaling Conference, that is how we're going to liberalize um, financial services uh, in Africa, is happening both at the WTO and at the CFTA level. And this presents a major danger. Because, for example, Nigeria has included the modalities of the financial services understanding on the financial services agreement uh, in the GATS that has um, uh, implications for prudential regulation that will spill over. So please could we focus on that? Thanks. Okay. Yeah. Okay, because you did not uh, you did not get to speak in the last Merci. round. Merci beaucoup. Uh, my question uh, is about uh, international arbitration because uh, I think that uh, one uh, uh, constraint uh, to uh, sovereignty is uh, that fear of uh, exit the International Center for Settlement of Investment Disputes uh, that's hanging uh, over uh, uh, developing countries. So uh, don't you think that besides uh, fixing uh, the debt, sovereign debt crisis, we need to reform uh, the arbitration, uh, international arbitration system too? Thanks. Okay, thank you. And also for further questions, there will be a break after this and Kai and Ndongo will still be here and happy to answer uh, further questions. Uh, merci pour, pour les questions. Uh, je vais commencer. En fait, il y, y a beaucoup de questions qui reviennent à quelle alternative finalement, en fait. C'est aussi la question de monsieur par rapport à uh, s'il faut avoir une politique monétaire dans le cadre d'une union monétaire, etc. Et uh, aussi la question de Okoli sur uh, quelle alternative. Pour moi, le, la zone de libre-échange continentale et les projets de monnaie unique en Afrique en fait, s'inscrivent toujours dans l'optique de comment être plus attractif pour l'investissement étranger, etc. Comment limiter les coûts de transaction, mais pas comment avoir plus de souveraineté. Donc, pour moi, ce n'est pas des projets panafricanistes, mais des projets, euh, disons, afro-libéraux. Donc, c'est le nom qu'on doit leur donner. Euh, Kroma avait mis en place, en fait, avait défini une voie panafricaniste. Peut-être qu'elle n'est pas opérationnelle à, à, à l'ère actuelle. Kroma disait qu'il faut l'unité politique. Pourquoi parce qu'avec l'unité politique, nous pourrons avoir des États viables. Parce qu'au moment de l'indépendance, c'était des, des petits États qui n'étaient pas véritablement viables. Et donc, grâce à l'unité politique, les Africains peuvent s'unir pour avoir une politique commune pour vendre leurs matières premières à de bons prix et avoir des surplus qui pourraient permettre leur industrialisation. Mais l'industrialisation ne se ferait pas à, à l'échelle des pays africains, mais à l'échelle continentale. Ce n'est pas la Côte d'Ivoire qui, qui s'industrialise ou la Tunisie, mais c'est le continent qui s'industrialise. Il y aura des gagnants et des perdants, mais grâce à l'unité politique, les perdants pourront être indemnisés et profiter, en fait, euh, être toujours, disons, favorables à, disons, l'intégration politique dans le cadre panafricain. Donc, le panafricanisme, au départ, c'était un projet de libération. Mais là, ce qu'on a, c'est différent. C'est l'afro-libéralisme, c'est-à-dire... On dénationalise les États et la politique économique. Vous n'avez plus de politique monétaire parce que vous êtes dans une union monétaire. Vous n'avez plus de politique commerciale et industrielle parce que vous avez signé des accords euh, commerciaux qui vous disent que vous ne pouvez plus utiliser vos tarifs douaniers. Vous signez des accords bilatéraux d'investissement qui vous disent que vous ne pouvez pas faire de contrôle de capitaux et que vous ne pouvez pas subventionner certains secteurs et que vous ne pouvez pas faire des politiques de préférence nationale. Donc tout cela, lorsque vous l'assemblez, le, vous, vous n'avez plus d'État en fait. Vous avez juste... Euh, voilà votre drapeau, votre hymne national, mais vous n'avez pas de politique économique. Et tous les projets qu'on a actuellement vont vers la dénationalisation des États. Alors que dans le cas du projet panafricaniste, on libère les instruments au niveau national pour une instance peut-être fédérale, régionale ou continentale. Donc c'est toute la différence. Donc là, la tendance vers laquelle on va, ce n'est pas vers plus de souveraineté, mais c'est vers moins de souveraineté et une forme de colonialisme multilatéral. C'est-à-dire que ce n'est pas la France qui va dominer ou le Portugal ou bien les États-Unis, mais c'est tous les capitaux. C'est la logique du capital qui va dominer sur la logique, disons, du, euh, disons, la logique territoriale des États, etc. 
Donc, c'est un peu comme ça que je vois cette question-là. Et donc, par rapport à, à la question euh, euh, aussi des, euh, des, en fait, des tribunaux, des tribunaux, ça aussi, c'est des choses qui sont dans les traités bilatéraux d'investissement. Les traités de, de, bilatéraux d'investissement, il faut les lire pour voir ce qui se passe. Et donc, euh, généralement, euh, c'est les élites africaines elles-mêmes qui ont parfois intérêt à signer ces accords bilatéraux d'investissement. Je vais juste donner un seul exemple. Euh, le fils du président du Sénégal, d'Ablaï Wad, à un moment donné, il a été poursuivi euh, pour, euh, disons, bien, euh, enrichissement illicite, en fait, pour enrichissement illicite. Et donc, à un moment donné, il y avait certains de ses actifs au Sénégal et l'État voulait les saisir. Et donc, quel a été son, son, son argument Son argument a été de dire qu'en fait, ces, ces actifs-là relèvent, disons, du droit de, de la, des Pays-Bas. Pourquoi Parce que la société qu'il avait été créée a été enregistrée aux Pays-Bas et dans un paradis fiscal, etc. Et donc, ils avaient des accords bilatéraux. On a un accord bilatéral d'investissement entre le Sénégal et les Pays-Bas. Et donc, en vertu de cet accord-là, on ne peut pas, disons, euh, nationaliser ou prendre, exproprier sans dédommagement. Et donc, ça veut dire que c'est les élites africaines elles-mêmes, parfois, qui ont recours à ce genre de stratégie. Mais pourquoi Parce que notre réglementation est tellement mal faite que si vous êtes un capitaliste africain, c'est beaucoup plus intéressant pour vous d'aller en Hollande ou dans un pays qui a, avec qui vous avez un accord bilatéral d'investissement, d'aller domicilier votre entreprise et de revenir pour profiter des avantages qu'offre le gouvernement aux investisseurs étrangers. Donc, c'est comme ça que ça fonctionne. Et donc, du coup, ces gens veulent souvent qu'on aille vers les tribunaux étrangers pour arbitrer les litiges qu'il y a. Et donc, ça aussi, c'est une attente atteinte à la démocratie. Et donc, ce qu'il faudrait, c'est d'autres formes de coopération, disons, entre les pays africains pour avoir, par exemple, une politique commune, par exemple, en matière d'investissement, ce genre de choses. Mais malheureusement, ce n'est pas encore le cas. Et donc, par rapport aux études sur l'impact de la traite négrière, etc., les réparations, euh, je ne sais pas trop, mais je sais qu'il y a une étude qui est fondamentale. C'est celle de Joseph Inikori, Africans and the Industrial Revolution, in England. Quand vous lisez ce livre-là, il vous montre très clairement, avec les chiffres à l'appui, que la révolution industrielle en Angleterre n'aurait pas été possible d'une certaine manière, ou en tout cas, les euh, profits récoltés durant cette phase de trade négrière ont été importants pour le financement de la révolution industrielle au Royaume-Uni. C'est une étude fondamentale. Joseph Inoukri, African and Industrial Revolution. Et par rapport à la question des réparations, là aussi je joins le... Je suis d'accord avec ce que dit Fadel Kaboub. En fait, quand le système ne marche pas, c'est le système qu'il faut réparer. Mais des réparations financières, ce qui va se passer, c'est juste, euh, disons, des flux de capitaux qui vont encore ressortir du, 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 du continent. Euh, C'est-à-dire à travers euh, des balances commerciales déficitaires, à travers le reflux des profits. C'est comme ça que cela se passe. En fait, c'est le système qu'il faut changer. Et donc, le type de réparation, si des réparations doivent être envisagées, c'est des réparations de na nature beaucoup plus structurelles, mais pas des réparations de type, euh, disons, financier. Yeah, I want to just uh, add one thing. Um, so our discussions have been about pos possibilities to exit from our current problems. And what we in our um, research uh, try to tackle is that with the rise of capitalism and the dependence on money comes necessarily dependence on different forms of money. So any kind of regional integration project that is uh, still exchanging with the outside of any kind of reg regional project will run in the same problems. Uh, so the necessity to de-link and come up with alternatives, which is a very classical topos also already proposed by Amin and also now, I think, suggested by Fadel and some others. Um, under capitalism, that's the only way, unless you overcome the capitalist compulsions of the global wealth market, because there is no other way. Because uh, it always tends to end up with some dependency on some specific commodities and specific forms of money. And unless you organize that locally, nationally, regionally, and, and reduce your exposure to the international environment, you will not gain uh, increasing policy space substantially, only slight degrees. And so Daniela's talk yesterday, for example, showed very clearly uh, financial actors know that sucking people and societies into the circuits of capital is needed, especially when there is stagnation in the global north. 
but without some kind of nurturing local, regional, and national uh, economies and social priorities. Um, and that means reducing the exposure to exchange and dollar denominated or soon maybe Chinese dominated uh, markets. That will not be possible. That's just something we uh, wanted to highlight. And this general point, I think, is, is important for, for our conference because it pushes us towards a certain degree of radicalism, I think. Thank you. And yeah. Okay. Uh, maybe maybe we can do this in the in the in the break, yeah. Because we will have a break now, and um, and you. I just have to announce something before we go into the break. Um, I said it before, but but there were not so many people. So um, uh, Silvia Federici, who uh, was uh, very eager also to speak at this conference, uh, unfortunately can't do so due to family uh, reasons. And uh, yeah, she wishes us all the best with the conference and is still very excited about it. However, in the program, for the program, this means that uh, there is a change. Uh, we will have the lunch break from 1 p.m. to 2 p.m. And afterwards, start uh, with the panel, uh, which paths towards a monetary system that enables a dignified life. And this means that we will in total then finish uh, one and a half hours um, um, before the time we, yeah, we should have finished, yeah. And please, all of us, stay for the concluding panel because we will discuss what comes after this conference. Which steps can we take from here? How can we continue? Thank you. Please be back here at a half past. Thank you.